Hi, uh, I'm Andy Keep. Uh, I'm one of the maintainers for Shea Scheme as well as a maintainer on the NanoPass framework. Um, and I'm going to talk, uh, give a workshop today on mixing mutability into the NanoPass framework. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, ELS organizing committee for having me. Uh, very generous of them to give me uh, an opportunity to give a little workshop in addition to uh, giving a keynote speech. Uh, so hopefully this is uh, interesting and uh, uh, will give you uh, an idea of some different ways of thinking about uh, how we use the NanoPass framework. To start with a little background, uh, the NanoPass framework is a DSL for writing compilers. It provides a syntax for defining the grammar of an intermediate representation. Uh, uh, if you saw my talk yesterday, this is the define language uh, term. Uh, that intermediate representation is immutable. Well, Technically, it's not immutable if you have any uh, ellipses in your production. Uh, lists of terminals and non-terminals are actually stored as scheme lists, and scheme lists are, are mutable. Uh, but we treat these as though they aren't going to be mutated, and we expect that users of the NanoPass framework aren't actually going to mutate them. The sort of right way to add mutability is by having a terminal uh, one or more terminals in your language that are themselves mutable. Uh, so either a record with some mutable fields in it uh, or uh, a pair or a box or something like that that already has uh, mutable uh, contents. We're going to look at using the uh, records to represent variables as well as basic block labels where those records have uh, some one or more mutable fields within them. To sort of give some uh, uh, context for all this stuff, uh, I've built a simple compiler uh, that is based on our um, uh, class compiler that we taught when I was at Indiana University. Um, so uh, the source language for this is a subset of scheme. Uh, we have uh, a handful of terminals here, uh, datum, which is our uh, pairs and vectors uh, or immediates, uh, immediates, which are true, false, null, void, and uh, fixed nums, or you know, small integers. Symbols, which are used for representing uh, variable bindings and references and those kinds of things. Uh, primitives, which are uh, uh, also symbols in, in the case of our source language. Uh, and uh, we have only a handful of primitives that we've implemented here. Primitives for dealing with pairs, so uh, cons, car, cutter, set car, bang, set cutter, bang. Uh, we have um, uh, ones for dealing with vectors, make vector, vector length, vector ref, and vector set bang. Uh, we have uh, some math operators, plus, minus, and multiply. Uh, and then we also have uh, comparison operators for integers and uh, predicates for uh, inquiring about the type of things. As far as our expression language goes, we have variable references, immediates, quoted datums, uh, one-arm diff, two-arm diff, and, or, and not, set bang, begin, lambda, let, let rec, and then two different syntaxes for calls, one for calling um, uh, functions that we've defined in the language, and one for calling uh, primitives. And we do this so that we don't have primitives that are just sort of free floating, that we would have to uh, have the students convert into a lambda expression. Now, this is our source language, but we're not going to actually translate all of the pieces of this into uh, a NanoPass language. We're going to use uh, an initial parser to eliminate uh, immediates uh, to get rid of our one-armed if and to turn our and, or, and not into some combination of ifs and let uh, bindings, uh, which is needed for the, the or case. So that's going to reduce our language to something a little bit simpler to deal with. Uh, some of these, though, we're also going to make the parser deal with for us. So in particular, uh, symbols uh, are not what we're going to use for our uh, variable representation. As I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to use a record to represent those. And so uh, we're going to replace symbols with uh, vars in the parser. Uh, primitives we're going to replace with primitive info. Primitive info is just a record that has some additional information about the primitive. Uh, uh, including things like uh, the arity of the primitive and uh, whether the primitive is side affecting, uh, produces a value, uh, is expected to be used in uh, predicate uh, position, those kind of, that kind of information. Uh, 
Our Lambda let and let rec also uh, are going to change a little bit. Uh, we allow them here in our source to have multiple expressions in them, uh, but we have begin in the language and there's no need for the nanopass uh, language uh, passes to actually need to deal with the multiple expressions here. We can just deal with them inside of begin. So the parser is going to eliminate uh, any of the multiple expressions and turn them just into a single expression, which if it needs to be, will be a begin. Finally, uh, we're going to make a small change to deal with uh, an inadequacy in the nanopass framework, uh, something that I hope to fix at some point. But uh, right now, if you have uh, multiple productions that sort of have the exact same shape and are differentiated by keyword, uh, the parser and meta parser doesn't handle it quite correctly. And so we are actually going to call this out into a separate uh, non-terminal called callable, which is basically just an expression or a primitive. And then our call uh, syntax becomes a callable followed by uh, its arguments. So we have a compiler, we have our source language, What's our target language? Well, I decided to make the target language LLVM 10. Uh, partially, I've been wanting to uh, uh, use LLVM as a backend for a while, uh, just as an experiment, uh, 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 professional curiosity. Um, but I thought this was a good opportunity uh, to uh, have a reason to do that. And so uh, I, I've built this uh, using LLVM 10. Uh, one of the upsides is that it's a bit lower level than C. Uh, our class compiler normally targets assembly language. Uh, obviously, we can make very assembly language-like uh, things in C, uh, but it's nice to have LLVM as just a, a, a more uh, is more similar to a regular assembler target. It also has better handling of tail calls. In particular, LLVM 10 has uh, a tail call calling convention. Uh, and allows us to specify when tail calls, when calls should be treated as tail calls. Um, uh, it also has a way of specifying that calls must be treated as tail calls. I ran into some problems with that, so our compiler does not generate that. Uh, it's something that I hope to revisit at some point. Uh, LLVM was balking at some of my use of it uh, because it was complaining about some of the type signatures, and I'm not really sure what I got wrong there, but I'll have to look into that at some point. Now, one of the downsides of LLVM 10 is that it's brand new. Uh, it was released earlier this year. So if you're trying to uh, use the example compiler, which I'll share the link for uh, uh, towards the end of the slides, um, then you will likely have to install LLVM and Clang yourself. Now, the good news about this is that that has become a much uh, less daunting process than it used to be, uh, but you do still have to actually uh, uh, build it or or pull down a pre-compiled version that someone else has provided. Things like Homebrew and uh, the built-in uh, Clang and LLVM compiler on the Mac, uh, where I've done all of my testing, um, uh, don't support it. This also required me to write uh, an SSA conversion. Uh, so um, LLVM requires things be an SSA. Uh, we could have cheated and just done uh, made all of our variables into memory location variables, but I wanted to actually do the SSA conversion. Uh, parts of it are, are decent, I think, and parts of it probably need revisiting. Uh, I would not uh, uh, spend too much time looking at that right now. Uh, it's likely to improve. So the overall compiler is composed of uh, 25 different um, passes uh, from parsing through uh, generating the LLVM code. Uh, today, we're only going to talk about a handful of them, uh, those that are focused on uh, using uh, uh, mutability. Uh, so we're going to talk about uncovering assigned uh, variables uh, and converting those assignments. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the passes involved in closure conversion, so uh, uncovering free variables, optimizing known calls, and introducing procedure primitives. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, something much lower level in the system, optimizing blocks, which is where we'll talk about how we use uh, uh, mutability inside of labels. So even though I didn't say we were going to talk about parsing, uh, I am going to talk for a moment about parsing, uh, because this is how we actually are going to set up our, our variables in the environment. So it's useful to understand how that works. Uh, so our, our parsing looks a little bit like uh, a very, very simplified uh, expander. Uh, 
uh, we're going to start with an initial environment uh, that has our uh, built-in syntax and primitives uh, in the environment to begin with. And then we're going to extend that environment every time we see uh, a new binding, a let, let rec or a lambda, uh, to bind all of those um, symbols that are used to represent the variables into um, variable records. When we see references to those symbols, then uh, we'll look them up in the environment and replace them with the variable record. The variable records contain uh, two bits of mutability, a flags field, which we can use for storing things like whether the variable is assigned or not, and a mutable slot, which we use for various purposes throughout the uh, compiler. And I'll, I'll give some examples of how we use those uh, as we go through this. Um, references and binding locations are, uh, share the same variable record. So we don't bother creating unique names for our variables uh, because uh, uh, each record, variable record represents a single variable and it's used everywhere that that variable is referenced. So just like symbols are EQ uh, in, in, the, in the language, every time we, we have the symbol X, it's always the same X. Uh, here, every time we have the variable that references X, it's the same record that references that variable. Because of this, we uh, won't need to build environments for our variables after this point. So we need one when we start a uh, parsing scheme, but once we've completed the parsing scheme step, uh, in general, we can get away without having to have an environment. We may have other things that we need to track, but we won't need a variable environment at least. Uh, it's worth noting that this is also how Shea Scheme handles variables. Uh, Shea Scheme has a, a more complicated um, uh, scheme for this, different kinds of uh, variables. So uh, variables that are introduced by users, uh, unspillable variables that are introduced during register allocation, uh, uh, frame variables and registers are also represented as variables, uh, but uh, we don't need all of that for our simple class compiler. So let's talk about assignment conversion. <clears throat> what is assignment conversion? So we have this uh, honestly not very good use of set bang here uh, to set X. Um, uh, it gives us a, a good simple example though to look at. Assignment conversion is going to turn uh, the code on the left into the code on the right. Uh, so every time we see an assigned variable, we're going to create a new variable uh, to capture its initial value. We're going to bind the original variable uh, to a cons uh, pair. Uh, and so uh, this gives us an, a heap allocated spot uh, that we can then mutate as we need to. Now, while uh, X uh, here uh, it has a very sort of well-defined lifespan, uh, and the set bang falls within that lifespan. In general, uh, mutated variables can have a lifespan uh, that uh, exceeds uh, their uh, uh, sort of syntactic scope here because we might capture them in a lambda uh, and then we need to make sure that we have the heap allocated storage to keep track of them. When we have references to variables, we're going to turn references to those assigned variables into uh, uh, a call to car for that variable extract the value that from the heap. And when we have a set, we're going to turn that into a set car. And when we're done with this, none of our variables will be assignable because all of the assignments will happen in this pair data structure that we've introduced to handle them. OK, so the first step of um, converting assignments is to find the things that need to be assigned. Uh, and this is it. This is the whole pass. Uh, so um, it's not quite the pass we would like to write because it's going to rebuild uh, the input expression into uh, an, uh, an identical output expression. We really only need to do the side affecting things here, uh, but the NanoPass framework uh, doesn't quite know how to generate all of that boilerplate code, uh, but it does know how to generate this kind of boilerplate code. So for the sake of brevity here, uh, I've, I've used this version uh, to uh, give you an idea. Basically, the whole point of this is when we see a variable is set, we mark it as assigned. That's it. So converting assignments is a little bit more involved, but it's actually not too bad. Uh, when we see that a variable is assigned, we replace it uh, with a call to car and that variable. Uh, if the variable isn't assigned, we just leave it alone. When we see a set bang, uh, obviously we know it's assigned at that point, <clears throat> and we convert it into a set car bang. And then at our binding sites, uh, lambda and let, uh, we need to 
convert our bindings. This is a place where we introduce new variables to handle uh, assigned variables, original values, and where we introduce the uh, pair bindings for these. And we do this inside this convert bindings helper function. It's worth noting that we don't need to do this for letrec because at this point in the compiler, letrec no longer has any assigned variables bound. Uh, so anything that's bound by a, a letrec is going to be uh, an unassigned variable. Convert bindings uh, is fairly straightforward. <clears throat> it uses this helper function with assigned. Uh, with assigned expects uh, this case lambda here. If it discovers that there are no assigned variables, <clears throat> we will have, uh, um, uh, we'll call this clause, which will just hand back the original binding list and the expressions. Otherwise, uh, we'll have some assigned variables and some new variables. We'll create uh, the cons pairs uh, with the uh, value from the new, uh, newly created variable uh, and uh, void. Um, and then we will create the assignments to assign uh, the assigned variable to uh, uh, that pair. And then from that point, point forward, we'll use car and uh, set car in order to uh, reference and set that variable. With assigned is, is pretty straightforward. It looks more complicated than it really is. Essentially, it's looping over all of our variables to find which ones are assigned. So when it identifies that a variable is assigned, it constructs a new variable uh, uh, from the original variable. Uh, it replaces that in the binding list, which is one of the three lists that it's maintaining here. It adds the assigned variable to the assigned list, and it uh, adds the new variable to the new variable list. And we use the assigned and new variable list, as you saw, in convert assignments to create the uh, uh, let bindings for the assigned variables uh, and the pairs. If we get to the end and we discover that we did not have any assigned variables, then we call uh, the first clause in our convert. Otherwise, we call the second clause in our the case lambda from our convert. So that's it for convert assignments. Now, well, maybe that's not quite it. So there is one small problem in this. Uh, you may not remember from the uh, overview uh, of the compiler that I gave to begin with, uh, but we actually have another pass uh, in between uncover assigned and convert assignments. I mentioned that our let rec uh, are no longer have assigned variables in them when we get to convert assignments. That happens in purify let rec. So let's talk for a moment about what purify let rec does. Purify let rec categorizes let rec bindings into assigned, simple, lambda, and complex. Assigned basically means that the variable was assigned. Simple and lambda are uh, cases where we have either a, a simple non-side non affecting expression uh, that is not a lambda, or we have a lambda. Um, so those are those two. And then complex is anything that doesn't fall into the, those first three categories. And so depending on how um, uh, sophisticated we make our identification of simple and lambda, uh, complex, uh, more or fewer things may be treated as complex. So how does this affect us? Well, the assigned variables are already marked as assigned, so there's no problem there. We don't have to do anything with those. The simple expressions and the lambda expressions are not assigned, and they don't become assigned as part of this process. So there's no need for us to do anything with those. Unfortunately, the complex uh, expressions, they do become assigned. Uh, if you learned the sort of traditional uh, scheme uh, uh, let rec handling, where you do uh, let bind uh, uh, the variables, you do some kind of uh, uh, binding to get all of the expressions, and then you set bang things into place so that uh, uh, to make the bindings recursive. Uh, that's essentially what happens with our complex ones. So they inherently become assigned as part of this process. And that means we need to track this assignment in Purify Lyrec. So I'm not going to show the whole Purify Lightrack pass. It's a little bit too complicated to fit on uh, one screen. But we're basically going to look for assigned variables. Those get added to our list of uh, complex variable and expressions. We're going to look for lambda expressions. They're going to get put into our list of uh, lambda bindings and lambda expressions. We're going to look for simple expressions. Same thing. They go into our list of simple bindings and simple expressions. They'll actually be bound with a let when we're done with all of this. And then finally, in the case where we have a complex variable, we're going to um, uh, mark it as assigned. 
Now, it's worth noting that part of the reason why I wanted to walk through this this way is that this is actually how I encountered this problem. I originally wrote the compiler without having done this, and then as I began testing, I ran into some very strange programs where uh, I didn't have bindings that I had expected to have, and it turned out it was all because I had forgotten to do this. So when we have mutable storage, particularly things like flags that we expect to be accurate uh, across the uh, multiple passes in the compiler, we have to be very careful that if we've done things that uh, can change the status of something that we're tracking, we make sure and note it. Uh, another way to handle this is that instead of uh, making purify let rec responsible for this, uh, we could simply have had uh, another pass after purify let rec that basically cleaned up our assignment flags. So if you uh, ever uh, want to dive into Shea scheme, you'll see places in there where we do both of these kinds of things. Okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about closure conversion. Uh, so the first step of closure conversion is free variable analysis. And I'm gonna go through this in a little bit of detail uh, because there's some subtleties in uh, how we do our free variable analysis and how we make use of our mutable storage. Uh, but to give you a basic idea, we have this uh, three nested lambdas. We're going to make flat closures. So that means that each level, any variable that's referenced inside, we need to have uh, as part of our closure. So uh, we're gonna figure out that the free variables in our lambda expression are X and Y, uh, our innermost lambda expression. Uh, that's because it binds Z, but it has references to X, Y, and Z. The next level out, uh, X is going to be a free variable uh, because it binds Y and Z is bound within it, even though X, Y, and Z are all referenced, uh, but X is bound outside. Finally, when we get to our outermost lambda, we won't have uh, any free variables because this is well, the outermost part of our expression. Now, the way we're gonna use mutability in here is that we're going to fill the var slot with an index uh, for each one of these variables. So X is going to get the index zero, Y is gonna get one, and Z is gonna get two. And then we're actually gonna use this in order to make a little bit uh, smarter set operations. Uh, now, you can't always do this trick with sets, but here we know the universe of things that can be in our set, and so we can uh, construct a bit mask that represents what those sets are. So our uh, bit mask notation for this here uh, is uh, 110. That is the zeroth bit is set because X is free, the first bit is set because Y is free, and the second bit or the third bit here is not set because uh, Z uh, is, is not set. Z is not free. Um, uh, similarly, at the next level, uh, only x is free, so only uh, the zeroth element is set. Uh, and finally, nothing is free uh, in the outermost. Uh, so uh, another kind of interesting property of this is that uh, we can build ourselves a little wall where we know we no longer care about variables because of the way we've numbered them. So this is sort of a clever little trick that Shea Scheme uses. Uh, and that we use in our compiler as well. Here, we know that nothing that uh, is outside of the index that was uh, um, that we started with uh, can possibly uh, be something we care about. So if we had additional bi variables bound within this, we know that none of those can ever be variables that we care about. So when uh, we reference them, we don't need to actually record them in our set. Similarly, at the next level up, uh, uh, the bar moves one further over because of the one variable that it binds. Uh, so it only has to worry about things that are less than one. And finally, in the outermost, uh, we don't have any variables that we ever care about because we know that there are no bindings outside of this uh, um, lambda expression. So uncover free is a little bit more involved to pass. Uh, the sort of core of it is Every time we see a variable reference, we're going to record that reference. And we record that reference in a record that we pass around called the free variable info record. Um, I'm going to uh, show you uh, this helper code in a, a moment, but uh, let's talk about some of the other parts of the pass first. Uh, so any place where we have uh, bindings uh, that are just sort of simple bindings, like a let or a let rec, where we're not trying to capture the free variable info, we still need to uh, uh, provide indexes for all the variables that are bound there. This is because those variables may be free in lambdas that are contained within the body of the let or the body of the let rec. Uh, 
So this is uh, pretty simple. It's recording the records on the way in, uh, the indexes on the way in, uh, uh, updating the variable slots and uh, clearing them on the way out. Uh, we'll see how that helper function works as well. Lambda is a little bit more complicated. We actually wanna record the free variables here. So every time we encounter a Lambda, we record uh, the free variable info file uh, uh, record for this. Uh, the, the free variable info we mark with the index when we were coming in. That actually gives us what we call the lid, uh, which is the, the line that I drew in the, the previous one, uh, previous slide where we had our um, marks in the bit mask. It also has with offsets, of course, because it needs to provide offsets for everything. And then you'll notice immediately within those offsets, uh, we evaluate the expression that is the, the body of the lambda. When we're done evaluating that expression, our free variable info record will have uh, built up all of the free variable uh, list that, that are free in this particular thing. Uh, when we uh, take that free variable list, we actually are going to mark the outer free variable list with all of our free variables. Uh, remember that those are only going to be marked in the outer free variable list if they aren't already bound by that, uh, whatever the outer lambda that contains this is. And so this way we are storing anything that we know is referenced within uh, the body of our Lambda so that when our uh, parent uh, Lambda constructs uh, this closure, uh, it, it has uh, all the free variables and the needs in order to construct it. So taking a look at what the with offsets does, uh, it's actually a, a simple macro that uh, expands into this function call and, and wraps the, the body in a Lambda. Uh, that function call sets the offsets for the variables, and we'll look at that in a moment. It then calls the body uh, with the, the updated index uh, and then clears all of the slots. Now, uh, you might wonder why we sort of, uh, as we enter and exit, create, uh, fill the slots and then clear the slots. We could, of course, wait till the end and clear the slots, and we could give every variable a unique number. Uh, but it's beneficial for us to try and keep these bit masks as small as possible. Uh, so we actually number as we go down. Not every variable has its own uh, unique index, uh, but it will have a unique index on the path to get to it. Um, uh, the uh, uh, variable slots here are cleared. If we ever encounter a variable that does not have an index in it, that has hash f in it, then we know that we have a variable reference outside of its scope because we actually clear this at the scope. Uh, so uh, our slot offsets uh, here uses uh, fold left to uh, set uh, the var slot with the new index and then increment the index. When we get done, we'll have our, our incremented index. So this is just a, a cute usage of fold left to do that for us. Record ref is really where all the interesting things happen here. Uh, you can see our uh, free variable info record here. It records a lid, a mask, and our list of free variables. And then record ref is used for uh, maintaining this. So the first thing we do is look at the index from uh, that we got out of the variable slot and check to see uh, if this uh, is a variable that we care about. So we can figure that out by seeing if the index is uh, less than our lid. If it is, it means it was bound outside of our bindings. We then grab the mask. If that was the case, we grab the mask for our um, uh, set out. Uh, really, uh, probably this should be called like uh, bit set or something like that. It's actually the, the uh, uh, bit field that represents the uh, our uh, set. Uh, if the index is not set already, then we set it and we add the free variable uh, to our free variable list. Um, now, of course, we could go through the, the bit set at the end and extract our free variable list, but it's easier if we just go ahead and maintain it here. Um, and so uh, we'll only ever add uh, uh, one of our free variables once to this. So we, we preserve that we sort of have a set coming out of this. And that's really it for uncover free. Before we get into talking about optimizing uh, our known calls, let's talk a little bit about what happens when we compile a function call. So here we have the function f. It's being called with the arguments uh, a, b, and c. Uh, the first change we're going to do is uh, add an, an extra argument, which is the closure pointer. 
Uh, so uh, here we pass the closure in so that that function has access to its free variables. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, how we identify those free variables just now. Uh, we're going to end up constructing a record based on that that's going to have a code pointer in the first slot. And then for each free variable, we'll have one more slot in the, in, uh, the closure. Um, now, f here in both cases is pointing uh, to this record. But when it's in the call position, we're going to treat it specially uh, at a later stage in the compiler. And we're going to have to extract uh, the pointer uh, uh, to our code. So procedure code here extracts that first um, element, uh, which is always going to be uh, the label for the function that we're going to try and call uh, so that it has its hands on it, can make, uh, uh, in the case of LLVM, can make the call instruction uh, for this. Now, uh, since this is just a label and we know that we put the label in there, in some cases where we know that the function is being called within the scope of the function, we also know uh, what label to call. And so we can optimize away uh, grabbing the uh, procedure code out of our closure uh, by doing something like this. When we see that we have our let rec bound to a label LF here, we have F as a closure. And then within the body of the closure, we're calling off to F. We can simply replace F with LF, and then we don't need to extract the label from uh, the closure. OK, so this pass is actually a fairly straightforward pass. Uh, we're going to look for places where we have our uh, let rec enclosures um, uh, combined here, where uh, L0 star and L star are really the same list. So this is the, the variables that are um, bound and the label that they're bound to uh, in, the, in the closure. Uh, for each one of them, uh, we simply set the var slot to contain the label. Then we process uh, the uh, functions that were bound by the let rec, as well as the body expression of the closures, uh, and uh, then clear uh, the var sl the slots. Again, uh, we shouldn't ever reference a variable slot without having uh, one of these labels in it uh, uh, if they are uh, if it's inside the scope. Uh, so. Um, uh, we're, we're free to clear these here. And of course, if we do encounter a variable reference where we uh, don't have uh, um, uh, this in scope, which might happen because we had a function uh, passed in as an argument to uh, a lambda, for instance, uh, then uh, we uh, can also handle those situations. We do that by looking for places where uh, we have a call where there's a, a variable as the call uh, and then we check to see if the variable slot has anything in it. If the variable slot has anything in it, it should be a label. We can create the uh, label call syntax so that we have um, our label piece here. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll just generate uh, the original call. And some later pass will turn that into uh, the uh, code that extracts the procedure call. So that's it for that one. OK, let's talk about how we introduce procedure primitives uh, at the sort of tail end of our closure conversion. So if we have a syntax that looks a bit like this at this stage in the compiler, let rec binds a label to a lambda expression. That lambda expression has an explicit uh, uh, closure pointer uh, variable that's going to hold our closure. Uh, we know what our free variables are, and so we're, we have this bind free form that basically says uh, x and y are bound inside of our closure pointer, and we need to extract them from uh, the closure uh, when we reference them. And then in the body of our let rec, we have this closures form that tells us uh, uh, what kind of closures we're going to construct and what they're going to contain. Uh, so uh, this is actually the uh, would be the code that would be generated for that innermost uh, lambda expression from our example earlier. So out of this, we're going to produce something that looks a bit like this. Uh, we're going to have a let rec is still going to bind a label to a lambda, but we're going to have eliminated our bind free form. We're also going to have eliminated our closures form and simply replaced it with a let and some calls to procedures. So the closure form uh, where we had f binding uh, 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 the closure lf xy, we make a new closure for lf with two slots for um, uh, free variables in it. Uh, 
and then we set the free variables x and y within that procedure. Inside of our function, where we see references to x, we uh, replace them with a reference to uh, the correct element in our closure. Uh, and then when we see y, we do the same thing for y. So this is a little bit more involved pass. Uh, and in fact, uh, in order to sort of fit all of this on the screen, uh, I've uh, taken the liberty of removing a handful of definitions and uh, some a handful of uh, uninteresting clauses from here. Um, if you look in the source code uh, at, at the end, you'll see that uh, I, I haven't tried to hide anything that uh, is meaningful for what we're talking about here. So uh, the first thing to notice is that we look for our let rec enclosures form again, just as we did when we were optimizing, but this time we're doing it so that we can uh, replace the let rec uh, uh, with uh, the simplified uh, uh, Lambda form in it and replace the uh, closures form with the let binding and uh, the uh, uh, procedure construction, uh, their make, make, make closure and uh, the procedure set being expressions. We also look for call sites. Here we special case call sites that are calling to uh, labels and primitives uh, because we don't want to extract a code pointer for those. We already know where those things are. And then for any uh, other kind of call uh, where we have an expression, we're looking for that expression and then we're going to call our procedure code uh, uh, extractor on it to get the label out for the call. Now, uh, when we have a Lambda, uh, we're going to bind uh, the variables that are bound in that bind free expression uh, uh, so that they can be, uh, uh, so that we can rewrite uh, references to closure bound variables with our procedure ref um, uh, syntax. And you can see that happens in our uh, terminal to non-terminal transformer here, where we're replacing uh, variables that may have been um, uh, in somewhere in the expression with uh, procedures, uh, uh, calls to the pr procedure ref in the cases where they are uh, bound in the closure uh, pointer. And now you'll notice that uh, in some cases, of course, we have variables that are not closure bound variables. And so we just leave those variables alone. So most of our construction functions build procedure ref build make proc bang and build procedure set bang. Uh, these are uh, all fairly straightforward uh, functions. Build procedure ref simply builds a call to the procedure ref based on uh, the information that we got out of the var slot for that particular variable. Uh, the var slot contains a pair with uh, the closure name of the closure pointer, as well as the index into the closure uh, for referencing that particular value. Make procedure just is a make procedure call. Uh, it has uh, the label that we're going to add to the procedure as well as the length uh, of the procedure that we need to generate. And then uh, procedure set bang uh, looks more complicated than it really is. That's because we're trying to uh, flatten uh, uh, nested lists here. Really at the end, all we're doing is creating a uh, procedure set bang expression for each one of the variables in each one of our uh, uh, closures that is bound as part of this uh, larger closures uh, expression. And so that's all we're doing with those. Uh, with free variable uh, is a little bit more interesting and it does something that we haven't seen yet uh, uh, with using our variable slots. Uh, I had said before that we don't need environments uh, when we have this, uh, but we do sometimes need to do a little bit of a dance to make sure that we have the correct values in that variable slot at uh, any given time. So here we do that by extracting the original value that was in the var slot. This might be false, or if our uh, if this variable was free in uh, the lambda that uh, is outside uh, the lambda that we're currently processing, it may have a completely different value. It will definitely have a different closure pointer, and it may even have a different index into the closure. So uh, we may need to make sure that we uh, store this so that we can restore it on the way out. Our next step is to replace those var slots with the information that we care about for uh, our particular function here. 
Um, and then as we go through the function, uh, uh, we're going to process the thunk. This was basically the body uh, of the uh, with FV star. You can actually kind of see it here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is the uh, lambda expression where we're going to call expr and produce our output lambda expression. Uh, and that will uh, that call to expr will replace all of our uh, closure bound variable references uh, and yield back the uh, final code that we were looking for. And then we carefully replace all of the original values back into our uh, free variable list. Now, there's no place in here where we ever clear uh, the free variable list slots. That's because we expect the slots to come in clear. So the outermost, uh, so the first time we encounter these variables, the original value will be false, and we simply are re restoring that false when that's the case. And so that's really it for uh, converting procedure primitives. And you can see here that where we might have otherwise had to maintain uh, an environment that was changing as we were uh, marching through the uh, lambda expressions by storing the original values and restoring them uh, on exit, uh, we can actually get away without having to construct an environment here. So let's talk about optimizing and reordering blocks. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit more complicated pass, uh, so I'm not going to show all of it. Uh, part of the reason why it's a little bit more complicated pass is that our optimized blocks actually implements uh, two uh, different algorithms for doing this. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, sort of more complicated uh, version of this. Um, but uh, basically, uh, we're going to have a clause that matches something that looks like this. Uh, this is how we represent our basic blocks uh, within our uh, functions at this stage in the compiler. So we have a list of local labels and a list of tails. Uh, tails are what our basic block is represented as. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with um, what a basic block is, a basic block in a, a compiler is basically uh, a series of inline instructions uh, where there are no branches and no jumps. Uh, so uh, you have um, straight line code that can just be executed by the processor. And then at the end of that straight line code, you either have uh, uh, a return, uh, a go to that jumps you to another label, uh, or uh, uh, a very simplified if expression that takes you to one of two labels. And at this point in our compiler, our if expression has been boiled down to a predicate and then the two labels that are jumped to, depending on whether the predicate is true or false. Now, when we see this uh, set of um, uh, basic blocks here, uh, oh, I, I should also mention here at the end, uh, we have a label as the body of this. That label L there is a representation of the entry label. So that is the first basic block we're going to start our execution at uh, when we uh, start re uh, running this function. So the first thing we're going to do is build ourselves a graph, and we're going to hand it uh, the labels, the list of labels, and the list of uh, tails, a uh, list of basic blocks here, uh, to get that going. Uh, you might think that this was pretty complicated, but it turns out it's actually pretty simple. Uh, we're simply going to create a graph node uh, for each one of our blocks, and then we're going to set that graph node uh, in the label slot. We don't really need to do anything more than this because the tail itself has embedded whatever label uh, follows it. So if it is uh, going to end in a go to or it's going to end in an if, those labels are actually evident there. And by coming through and uh, side affecting the label slot, we've essentially just linked up our entire graph, which is pretty cool and actually uh, a pretty nice use of uh, uh, mutability here uh, to make our lives a little bit easier. The main uh, body of this uh, optimized pass um, is using what's called a work list algorithm. So we create an initial work list. Our initial work list is just that we are going to add uh, the basic block that starts all of this off. So we know obviously that our entry uh, basic block is going to be reachable, but we don't necessarily know that all of our blocks inside are, are, we don't necessarily know that our blocks inside are ordered the way we want them, and we don't necessarily even know that all of them are going to be reachable. Uh, in particular, one of the things that we do as a part of this is get rid of what we call jumps to jumps. Uh, so uh, if you think about a basic block as being uh, zero or more instructions followed by some kind of uh, either uh, uh, if or jump, uh, 
in the cases where you have zero instructions and simply a jump to another um, uh, clause, which is something that can happen, for instance, uh, if you have um, uh, had had a one-armed if uh, in our initial source, uh, we may have a, a body uh, in a side effecting position where uh, it, it does nothing, it's just a void. That will produce a jump to jump in the language. We could preserve those blocks. There's no harm in preserving them, uh, but there's also no need to preserve them. And so we would like to get rid of any place where we have a block to uh, jump to a jump uh, and just uh, uh, throw those blocks on the floor and instead jump directly to the final target. I'm going to show a little bit about how we do that in a moment. Uh, so uh, assuming our work list isn't uh, empty, we're going to grab the first item off of that work list. Now, we don't want to put a block on more than once, so we're actually going to make sure uh, that uh, if we already have written this particular block, uh, that we don't try and process it again. If we haven't already written it, you'll notice that we mark it as having been written because we are definitely going to write it as part of this process. Um, and we call this rewrite tail function. Now, I said that we had linked up uh, our, our graph, and of course, we have linked up, had linked up our graph to begin with, uh, but we had not actually figured out what the next uh, phase within that graph was uh, going to be, what the, the next nodes within that graph were going to be. We left that for this pass uh, to come through and walk uh, the uh, basic block and figure out uh, what the next points are going to. So we hand it not just the node, uh, uh, not just the, the, the block, we also hand it the work list so that it can hand us back the rewritten block as well as the work list. Finally, when we're done with all this, we clear all of our slots. Essentially, we, we throw away our graph uh, and then we generate out our labels, uh, reversing uh, the list of labels and tails that we built up because of course we started from the entry label and moved towards the end. Uh, since we are consing those onto the front, we have to reverse those lists to get them in that back in that order. Rewrite tail here uh, is uh, looks uh, more complicated than it really is. Uh, looks scarier, I should say, than it really is. Uh, ultimately, what we're looking for are places where we reference a label. Uh, so uh, in a go to. Uh, if we return a label, which I, I don't think we ever actually return a local label, but if we did return a local label, it we could catch it here, um, as well as uh, in the case of if, where we have our two local labels uh, for the uh, uh, consequent and the alternative uh, of the if. Uh, we also potentially have labels referenced and in side effects. We might be putting those labels into um, uh, uh, heap allocated storage. Uh, we might be uh, setting them into local variables. Now, I don't believe that we actually do produce any code that does that today, but we want to make sure that if we do reference a label within here, uh, we don't accidentally uh, dump it on the floor uh, when we go through this process. So we have to make sure that we add those to the work list as well if we encounter them. Once we know what our label is, uh, we extract the final target for that label. And this is basically the process of uh, figuring out what our jumps to jumps are. So when we initially created our records, the one thing that we did do uh, looking in the basic block was to see if that basic block was one of these simple jumps to jumps. And if it was a simple jump to jump, we have actually marked it in the record. We do a little bit of path shortening uh, in our uh, extract final target. So we'll actually try and loop through uh, the label records until we find a label record that no longer has a jump to jump target. And then we'll relabel all of the labels leading up to it so that we know what the final target is. So we only have to do that uh, work once. Uh, but extract final target is going to uh, give us whatever that final target is. Finally, we're going to add that to our work list. So because we don't add the intermediate uh, jump to jump blocks in our work list, we'll actually never produce code for them. They'll just get dropped on the floor here. And so that's optimized blocks. Now, these aren't the only uses of mutation in a compiler. There are a few other places where uh, we make use of mutation in order to get at um, uh, different pieces or make our lives a little bit easier. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, the first one of these is what I will call my lazy on two fronts uh, um, style mutation. So uh, uh, scheme, or at least some 
versions of Scheme have a fluid let. Uh, this allows you to um, uh, bind variables, uh, bind a variable that is bound from an outer scope uh, within a particular scope. It does that by doing a trick similar to what we did with um, our uh, closure conversion uh, or our uh, 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 introduced procedure primitives pass. Uh, I say it's lazy on two fronts because if I wasn't so lazy when I was writing the compiler, I could actually thread uh, the values for these through. Uh, and if I wasn't so lazy when I wrote the NanoPass framework, I would have made it easier to do that kind of threading. Uh, but uh, unless and until I do that, FluidLED is a convenient way of doing that. So convert complex datum uses this trick uh, in order to build up a list of uh, bindings and um, uh, construct, uh, construction functions for uh, all of our constants. This allows us to lift all of our constants outside of uh, the body of the program, uh, which we want to do to make sure that they are in fact constant. Uh, they are constructed when the, compile, when the program starts running, uh, but they are constructed outside of the view of uh, the rest of the program, and that's how we do it. Lift let rec also uses fluid let in order to gather up all of the uh, uh, bindings uh, for labels to functions up to the top level. Uh, so we have a single list of labels and functions when we get done, and this just scrapes through the entire thing, getting rid of all of our let rec expressions uh, from the body of the language and pulling it up to one single let rec expression up at the top. Uncover locals, again, uses fluid let in order to uh, build up the locals list. Uh, it turns out this is a technique we use uh, frequently. Uh, our remove, remove complex operator, uh, operand rather, remove complex operand pass uh, also uses this because it can introduce new local variables uh, as it's um, uh, doing its work. So sometimes we need to introduce new temporaries. Uh, we simply bind our, our locals list uh, uh, with fluid let and uh, update it as we go. Expose basic blocks also uses it uh, again. Uh, it can introduce local uh, variables in a, a couple of places, and so uh, we use this to keep track of those things. Uh, the convert to SSA pass, which I mentioned uh, is um, uh, probably needs a little bit of cleanup, uh, is actually uh, one that uses quite a bit of mutation in a variety of ways. So we use the var slot uh, for variable renaming uh, as we go through, uh, so any multiply assigned variable we make sure and uh, mark those uh, renamed. Uh, we use the flags on the variable in order to figure out uh, which variables are multiply assigned. So we have a, an assigned flag as well as a multiply assigned flag. Only multiply assigned variables uh, need to have this uh, uh, fee functions generated for them. And so we use that to pare down the work that we're doing a little bit. We also use the label slot to create the control flow graph for uh, convert to SSA. Uh, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the uh, uh, single static assignment form conversion, uh, you can use a control flow graph to build yourself uh, what's called the uh, dominance tree. From the dominance tree, you can figure out what the dominance frontier is. And from the dominance frontier, you place these fee functions, uh, which are a way to get at uh, uh, what value a variable that was assigned down different paths has at a given place in the compiler. Uh, normally, uh, there would be a separate, uh, uh, since fee functions are sort of imaginary, there would be a separate pass to get rid of those fee functions. For us, that pass exists as part of uh, the LLVM uh, framework, and so we don't have to worry about that piece of it. Uh, another pass that we have is eliminate simple moves. This was a pass that I had to introduce because LLVM uh, gets upset with you if you have uh, simple uh, variable to variable assignments. Uh, or variable to simple constant assignments. And so when we see those things, we use this path, pass to eliminate those, and we use the var slot in order to star, store the variable or um, uh, simple constant that we had originally bound in uh, the variable that we're getting rid of. So just to wrap up a bit, uh, limited and controlled use of mutable storage can be pretty useful. Uh, I, I for the most part, feel like uh, mutability is something that we want to uh, it have as a tool in our tool case, but one that we want to use uh, sparingly uh, and only when we have need of it. 
uh, mutable information that lasts across passes, uh, we have to make sure and maintain it, as we saw with uh, assignment conversion. Uh, when mutable stores are being used within a, a single pass, we need to make sure that we clean up after ourselves, uh, in particular because uh, sort of the contract of that pass is that it's going to make use of that mutable storage and it's going to leave it for other passes to find empty. Uh, if you make a mistake and forget to clear these things out, you can end up with some pretty unexpected uh, things happening later on uh, where you thought you had something and you didn't really have something in there. You just had something that was left over from a previous pass. It's worth noting that we do assume uh, that we don't have uh, multiple threads operating on the same program at the same time. Uh, we could actually have them operating on different functions within the same program without too much worry, but we need to make sure that our mutable storage is protected so that we don't have multiple things writing to it or reading from it at the same time. Uh, with mutable storage, we can avoid the cost of restructuring environments uh, by using records, as, as we saw uh, in several examples today. Um, and you can try all of this out yourself. Uh, I've made the source code available uh, at the scheme to LLVM uh, repository in my GitHub account. Um, and with that, I'll just say thanks. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, on the uh, uh, chat. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I hope that was uh, uh, informative. Thanks.